number on the screen. This evening, Books and Books is thrilled to welcome back Mr. Chris Gillibo, presenting his new book, Born for This, How to Find the Work You Were Meant to Do. Chris is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The $100 Startup and The Happiness of Pursuit. He is also the creator and host of the annual World Domination Summit, a gathering of cultural creatives that attracts such speakers as Susan Cain, Brené Brown, and Gretchen Rubin. Chris speaks at dozens of events, companies, and universities, including Google, Facebook, South by Southwest, Evernote, and many more. In this book, through inspiring stories of those who have successfully landed their dream career, as well as through actionable tools, exercises, and thought experiments, Chris will guide you through today's vast menu of career options to discover the work you are perfectly suited to, your new, I'm sorry, (laughs) career options, to discover the work perfectly suited to your unique interests, skills, and experiences. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Chris Gillibo. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much. Hello, Miami. Hi, yeah, what's up? Super excited to be back in South Florida. You guys are amazing. We are actually co-creating something together. The book is still very new. Uh, I think this is stop number nine or 10 of my tour. I'm doing 35 cities eventually, so it's perfect because I'm not nervous now, but I'm not exhausted, right? So you guys get like the best. I've been at Books and Books uh, several times, as Victor mentioned. Um, Always a great crowd, a great community, um, and a great conversation. So we'll have a conversation tonight. But I was thinking back about uh, how all this got started. And in some ways, I've been on the road for about two weeks now. In uh, some ways, it reminds me a lot of my first tour when I went to all 50 states. And on that tour, I went to lots of great bookstores. But I also went to lots of other spaces, because lots of my stops were arranged by readers directly. And so I went to a yoga studio. I went to a pizza parlor in Anchorage. went to some bars, some co-working spaces lots of different places. And they were all really great, except one. And I won't tell you what city this particular space was in. It wasn't Miami. It wasn't in Florida. But uh, a few weeks before I went there, uh, my co-host emailed me and said, hey, Chris, I got the perfect place for you. You're going to love this venue. It's in a grocery store. And I kept waiting you know, for the second part of the story. And there wasn't one. Um, and so I thought, that sounds like a really bad idea. But I'll try anything once. And so I went, and I was thinking, maybe it's not really a grocery store. Maybe it's like something else, just called a grocery store for some reason. Um, But it was literally like being in the middle of Publix and and speaking to a group about this size. And there was industrial lighting, of course, and the acoustics were terrible, and people are pushing their carts past us. And every once in a while, the um, announcer would come over the PA, and he would say, Things like, there's a two-for-one special on pound cake. (laughs) Also, author Chris Gillibo is speaking in the middle of the store. And I was like, wow, now I've really made it, which is great. Um, So that tour was good, but I said no more grocery stores after that. I'm going to stick to awesome places like Books and Books. And so I'm so glad you guys are here. What I'd love to do is share a few stories, tell you a little bit about the book. uh, But more importantly, I'll share some lessons that we can apply actually give you four specific things, four actions you can do tonight, tomorrow, next week, uh, to make real improvements in your life and work. And uh, pretty much everything we do is focused around this topic. Uh, Everything we'll do tonight is focused around this topic of how to find the work you were born to do. Um, And so speaking of conversation, you know, after I do this little presentation, we'll have a conversation. And I'll facilitate it, but you'll all be welcome to to ask questions uh, or contribute a comment. But first, I have a question for all of you, and hello to everybody who's watching online as well. Do you remember when you were six years old and some adult asked you this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? How many of you remember your answer to that question? Raise your hand. Nicole, what did you want to be? I wanted to train dolphins. You wanted to train dolphins? Yeah. Did you grow up to become a dolphin trainer? No. No. You did not. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Go ahead. I wanted to be a photographer for National Geographic. Wanted to be a photographer for National Geographic. 
Did you grow up to become that? No. Not yet. Who else in this section had their hand raised? Yes, in the back. Uh, Major League Baseball player. Major League Baseball player. Are you doing that now? No. Nope. All right. <laughs> One more person here. Yes. A bed. What? To be a bed. You wanted to be a bed? Yeah. Be a veterinary. Ah, OK, a bed. Sorry. I <laughs> couldn't hear you. Thank you for clarifying. I was very confused. <laughs> My fault. She wanted to be a veterinarian, a vet. That's great. You are a vet? No. no. OK. And then you had your hand up also? Uh, I wanted to be a CEO. CEO. Not that. OK. You notice the theme here. OK. And uh, I'm just going to walk over here. Anybody on this side of the room? Did you have your hand up? Yes. I wanted to be the surgeon. You want to be a surgeon. And? Uh, not a, an actual doctor surgeon, but in a, in a certain way, I do dig, uh, cut deep and dig deep and, okay. and fix what's broken. OK. Not broken, He's not a, OK. He fixes things. He cuts deep. Right. Yes? Actress. Actress. OK. A couple other people. You're not. OK. Yes? A cowgirl. A cowgirl. OK. <laughs> Yeah, cowgirl in Miami. All right. <laughs> you grew up somewhere else, I guess. OK. And then maybe one, one more person. Yes, OK. Dancer. A dancer. Yeah. All right. And are you a dancer? You are. All right. Is there anyone else here who had a totally crazy idea? Because you know, dolphin trainer is awesome. Being a major league baseball player is awesome. Totally crazy idea. Raise your hand. Everybody else? Yes? President of the United States. President of the United States. Well, that's not crazy. I mean, I'm going for it. You're going for it. That's great. Awesome. 2016, 2020? We'll see. OK. Um, is there anyone here, because just about everybody who shared is actually not doing what they imagined, um, is there anyone here who's actually doing that thing that they imagined when they were six years old? Yes, what was that thing? A writer. A writer. And you are writing now. Are you, are you writing books? Are you a journalist? Are you... Uh, I'm writing a book right now, but okay. I have a short story that's already up on Amazon. Great. Already right, got a short story up on Amazon. Congratulations. Thank you. It's good. Anybody else? Going once? Yes? Yeah, I wanted to be an architect. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be an architect, grew up to become an architect. OK, great. So we can see um, that these guys are kind of the exceptions, because most of us uh, actually have no idea when we're six years old what we want to be and what we're going to grow into, or even when we're 16, or even when we're 26, or sometimes 36. Uh, we really don't know. So I'll tell you my story. When I was six years old, I had twin aspirations. There are two things I wanted to do. Couldn't decide what was better. Uh, first thing, my dad worked for NASA, so I wanted to be an astronaut. And one day, he took me into his office, and there was a space shuttle launch. He gave me an assignment. Now, looking back, as an adult, I can see it was probably a fake assignment. Like, he probably just kind of made it up. But when I was six, I thought that was a critical assignment. I thought I was solely responsible for the success and safety of the space shuttle launch. Right? It was like, it's all riding on me. you know. So I fulfilled my duties, and the launch was successful. I saved the world. And after I saved the world, I went to my favorite restaurant, which was Burger King. Because when I was six, um, Burger King was the greatest place in the world. And if it was my birthday, if I had just saved the world, if it was a Monday or a Tuesday or a Thursday, if anybody said, where do you want to go? To eat, I would always say Burger King. So when an, an adult would ask me, like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Sometimes I would say I want to be an astronaut. And sometimes I would say I want to work at Burger King. <laughs> and I noticed that people's responses were very different, <laughs> depending on what I said. Um, but at the age of six, I didn't really understand the difference. I just thought they were both cool places. I liked going to my dad's work. I liked going to Burger King, or french fries, onion rings, you know, unlimited potential. But I didn't realize that. Um, you know, in the long term, there's actually very different potential with those careers, um, very different compensation, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, I grew up. And I wasn't smart enough to work for NASA. But I was smart enough to realize that a career in fast food was not the best path for me. So I started a series of small businesses. I really liked working for myself. I was very, very motivated um, at creating something that I believed in. Uh, when I was working for someone else or working on someone else's vision, wasn't motivated at all. So I was kind of like 110% motivated for something I believe in, 5% motivated for something I'm not. So I had to kind of find a way to craft a career around things I was motivated to do. So started some businesses, uh, started traveling. I uh, lived for four years in West Africa on board a hospital ship as an aid worker. Uh, then I began this quest uh, to visit every country in the world, uh, which I wrote about and talked about in my last book, The Happiness of Pursuit. At a certain point, I started writing about these things, about travel, about entrepreneurship, different ways of, of living or thinking about the world. And now, 
one way or another, um, everything I do is kind of oriented around community. Uh, not so much educating people, um, but much more connecting people and recognizing that you know, all of us have something we could learn from someone else. And how can we support other people who have dreams of their own, who want to make the world a better place, who want to do something really amazing? So this was a very nonlinear path. It wasn't like I said you know, from the beginning, here's my goal. I'm going to work toward this goal. I didn't really know where I was going. Uh, I just kind of followed a value along the way. And your path is probably different from mine. But you too had to make choices. And you had to make decisions. And maybe you're still making choices and decisions. This isn't just something you do when you're young. All kinds of things happen along the way. And very often, we make these decisions with limited information. Just like when I was six, didn't really know what a career at NASA was like. We have this haze of uncertainty that kind of covers a lot of these decisions and choices. What are we going to study? What are we going to go into? If we're going to be a writer, what kind of writer are we going to be? If we're going to be something else, like what is the expression of that? So we don't really know. We're kind of just making guesses. Maybe we're making educated guesses. Maybe we get really lucky. But sometimes we don't know. We wonder, is the grass greener somewhere else? Um, is there something better? And so what a lot of us end up doing, one way or another, is settling or compromising. And we say, OK, you know, maybe I can't have it all. But that's OK. Uh, I'm going to just work this job as a means to an end. Like I have to have a job, so I don't like the job, but uh, I'm going to spend a third of my life working so that I can support myself you know, for the other two thirds. Or maybe I'm going to follow my passion. Maybe there's something that I love to do. Uh, but if I do that, then there's not a lot of money in that. So I'm going to kind of give that up. right? And I'm going to be poor, but I'm going to be happy if that's what happiness means to me. Um, so we end up making this choice or settling or compromising. And, and sometimes in life, there's nothing wrong with settling or making a trade-off. Uh, but I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal, if we're thinking about self-actualization, if we're thinking about improving ourselves and actually following that dream, you know, the goal is essentially to not make that compromise, you know, to find a way to forge both your money and your life and something else that I'll tell you about in a moment. But first, there's this story. It's actually a poem by Robert Frost. And many of you, if not all of you, know this poem. And in this poem, there is a traveler who's kind of going along his way. And the traveler comes to a fork in the woods. And the poem starts off, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. And then eventually he has to decide, OK, am I going to go right? Am I going to go left? He makes kind of an evaluation. And eventually he says, you know, I chose the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So like a lot of good art, uh, this poem has more than one interpretation. But one interpretation is that uh, the traveler made the right choice. Like he evaluated this decision, chose the right thing. The other path would not have been as good. And maybe that's true. But we don't know. Because we don't know what was down the other path. We don't know the other story. Like maybe the other story was just as good. Maybe the other path was better, right? So I spent you know, probably the past 10 years uh, working with all kinds of people, uh, pursuing unconventional work, uh, trying to find a way to not settle, to not compromise, but, but to have both their money and their life uh, and to do something that they're really good at. And over the past three years, I've been really focused on this question of a dream job, of how do you find your dream job? How do you create your dream job if it's something that hasn't existed before? I spent a lot of time talking with people from all different backgrounds, different ages, men and women, uh, who had all kind of found this for themselves. And what I saw is that uh, almost none of them followed a linear path. Almost none of them kind of knew, like, here's this thing from a young age that I'm going to work toward. Here's my objective. And then when I get there, I'm going to continue refining toward that objective. They actually went down lots of different paths. It was very nonlinear. And not only did they go down lots of different paths, they also weren't afraid to go down a path and then turn back around. They weren't afraid to say, actually, you know, I, I thought this was the answer, um, but I don't think it is actually now. Or maybe it was the answer for a time, and now I want to do something different. So they weren't afraid to kind of go back and say, actually, I want to take the other path. Or maybe I want to carve out an all-new path for myself. So they made a lot of mistakes. And I thought it was interesting, because the first observation is like, OK, it's OK to make mistakes. Like, it's all right. You know, like, you're going to be OK. 
But maybe a better observation is that the mistakes actually helped them. The mistakes benefited them because the mistakes gave them information to make those choices that we talked about. They had the haze of uncertainty, but then they had experience. They made mistakes. They kind of stepped out, and they weren't afraid to step back. There was a story I read about in the book, a woman named Laura who was an actor. She'd been on several TV shows, been successful, uh, and then she wanted to make a big change because the acting was fine for a while, but she wanted to do something different. She wasn't sure at first what it was, so she went kind of down this long and winding road. And I love what she said. She said, I never had a eureka moment. It wasn't like something kind of descended you know, from the sky, like this is your thing. I had a process of discovery that led me to something that provided the autonomy I craved. So it was a very values-based search. It wasn't a goal-based search. It was like, here's my value. I want autonomy. I want freedom, independence, more ownership, more choice. And I'm going to follow that and kind of see where it goes. So even though people can follow these paths, and go down lots of different paths and arrive at different destinations, uh, what I found is that most people who do find that dream job or create the dream job or win the career lottery, however you like to think about it, they all have three things in common. They're all three qualities of this kind of work. And the first quality is something that you love to do or joy, something that does bring you happiness because life is short. Why not do something that's actually meaningful that you believe in? But the second quality, as I said earlier, is something that's sustainable, money, something that's financially viable. So not just a hobby. It's OK to do something for love. It's OK to do something that's not you know, financially rewarding, but that's not a career. So we're talking about a career, we're talking about work, joy, money. And a third quality, what I called flow, which is essentially doing something that you do really well, using your skills in a unique way, something that you're really good at. Maybe other people aren't good at it doesn't come natural to them, but it does to you. It's the kind of work that you can get lost in for a couple of hours, and the time goes by, and you're like, oh, I didn't realize I've been doing this all this time because I've been in this kind of zone. So it's joy, money, and flow. And those who are successful, when I say successful, I mean by your own definition of success, not some other definition, not necessarily wealthy or status, uh, unless that's important to you. But your definition of success, whatever that means, uh, they work toward the intersection of these three qualities. You know, joy, money, and flow. How can I have not just one, not just two, but actually all three of them? And if we look at some famous people, we can look from the outside at celebrities and say, you know, they were actually clearly born to do this thing. Like they are so good at what they do. Like they were meant to do this, and nobody could do it as well as them. And there could have been more than one path for them too. They could have done something else as well. Beyonce could have been a dentist or a vet or an accountant. But it sounds kind of absurd, right? Roger Federer could have been a Swiss watchmaker or something else. Um, sponsored by Rolex. That's right. But they didn't. And aren't we glad they didn't? Because they found you know, not just success, but ultimately the, the, the apex or the pinnacle of not just a career, but an entire industry. And it's not just about celebrities or famous people. I actually don't look at a lot of famous people in the book. You can probably think of somebody that you know that kind of fits this model. You can probably think of someone that maybe you went to high school with them, then you lost touch, and then five years later, 10 years later, 20 years, you run into them on Facebook or in real life, and you hear what they're doing. And you realize that's a perfect fit for them. Like, I didn't even know what they've been doing all this time, but I can think back when I knew them. They had these traits. Of course, she became a doctor. You know, of course, he became a teacher. You know, he was always disciplined. You know, he was always good at communicating. You can see these traits. So sometimes we can recognize in other people, you know, when they found this kind of special thing, when they found this work, but we don't always recognize it in ourselves. So here's the second major thing that I learned through the research process. Understanding career happiness or success, again, as you define success, um, is not just about a profession. It's not just about your vocation or your job. It's about how you do that kind of job, how you do that kind of work. And this is very, very understudied. Almost all career counseling is about professions. When you're six years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be this. I want to be this profession. When you're 17 and you're thinking about going to college, I want to study this so I can become this. Or if you're a bit older and you're taking on a second act or a third act, you're always thinking about professions. You know, I want to change this career to this. 
but it's all profession-based. And what is just as important is what I call working conditions. So working conditions is really understanding the kind of environment under which you thrive, under which you do your best work. So working conditions are things like how you like to spend your time, your ideal schedule, like what works best for you, how you like to be rewarded or motivated, compensated. It's very different for different people. How collaborative you are, how much you want to work with other people versus how much you want to work on your own. Pretty much everyone here wants to do some of both, but the range is tremendous. Like some of us are like really benefit from that social structure, really benefit from having a team, from having the same kind of work hours. We're all there together. We have these shared objectives. We do our best work like that. Others of us, we want to work on our own. We want to kind of go in a little cave and produce something. And maybe eventually we'll share it with other people. Maybe it will become collaborative. But we actually kind of crave that independent space. So if you can begin to understand that about yourself, OK, what are my ideal working conditions? To be able to make better decisions as you go forward. And you can kind of see the match between the right kind of work and the right kind of working conditions like this. If you have a good job and you're doing something that you believe in, but the working conditions aren't good, you're going to be stressed out. You have a boss that's overly negative. You have a conflict with somebody you work with. If the schedule doesn't work for your needs or your family's needs, it's stressful. On the other hand, you could have really great working conditions. You have like an amazing environment. You could work for one of these tech companies that has unlimited vacation and margarita Mondays, free beer, you know, all kinds of perks. And it's awesome, but if you don't actually believe in what you're doing, then ultimately you're going to be unfulfilled. Most of us want to be part of a mission. We want to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. We actually want to care about our work. So we can do that for our time. But we're going to be stressed in one scenario. We're going to be unfulfilled in the other. And what we're looking for is the right kind of work, something that we do believe in, and the right kind of working conditions, like the conditions that work best for us, which are very individual. So if you're trying to figure out, OK, what are my ideal working conditions, you can go to the website, bornforthisbook.com. There's a free quiz there. You don't have to register or give me your email address. I'm going to answer 14 questions. And uh, we'll give you a specific personality type, along with some really clear recommendations, some real tips and strategies that you can use as you make your own decisions. It will help you better understand like, how you do your best work according to those working conditions. So I said I'd give you four actions, four things. First thing, I mentioned joy, money, and flow. We talked about that, the convergence point, or the intersection between all three of these qualities. I realized that no one here, including myself, has 100% autonomy over how we spend our time. If you have your job, you have to report to someone. You have things you have to do. But even if you're self-employed, you have commitments. You have responsibility. So we all, we all have certain things that we have to do. Um, but wherever we do have autonomy, wherever we are able to make choice, then think about these three qualities. When you come to a path, and you have to go left, you have to go right. Think about which choice is going to lead you closer to that intersection between something you love to do, something that is financially rewarding or sustainable at least, and something that you're really good at, something that uses your skills in a unique way. Here's a very simple thing that I try to do every day, and all of you can do this. At the end of the day, you take out your journal. If you're not a journal person, you can use a post-it note. And you answer this question, did today matter? You answer it based on your own evaluation, like your own standard. And I believe that when most of us do this, when we think about this question for ourselves, we're going to know what the answer is. We're going to be able to think, OK, you know, today I made progress on the goals that I believe in. Got a little bit closer you know, on that thing that I'm working toward. I invested in the relationships that are important to me. And maybe something went wrong at a certain point, but, but that's OK, because I can look back at the whole day, and it, it was a good day, and it mattered. Or you might say, actually, you know, today was kind of the opposite. Didn't start very well. I spent the whole day kind of responding to things. I wasn't really initiating anything. I wasn't really creating anything. Maybe I actually moved backwards in something. Or maybe, like we've all had days, or many of us have had days, where we spent the whole day at work. We don't really know what we did. We kind of look back and we're like, what actually happened? Right? I was there for x hours, 6 hours, 8 hours, maybe more. Did I actually make any progress? So that day, we would say, maybe it doesn't matter so much. So I think we're all going to have bad days in life, like that happens. But the goal is a streak of days that matter. 
the goal is being able to say like over and over, yes, you know, today I did make progress, you know, on those things that I believe in. And as we answer that question, I think we're going to learn more about ourselves. We're going to learn what are the qualities that lead me to say today was not just a good day, but it actually mattered. We're going to learn what gives us energy, what drains our energy, will help us make better decisions. Second action, I don't think that everyone should be a full-time entrepreneur. I think it's totally possible to live a fulfilled, purposeful life working for a company or an organization. But I do think everyone should learn to think entrepreneurially. I think that's absolutely vital today. And I also believe that everyone should have more than one source of income. And so that's where a side hustle can come in. Doing some kind of side project. I'm not talking about a part-time job. I'm talking about something that you create, something that you have ownership over. And I hear stories all the time from our community of people who say things like, you know, I, I never planned to be an entrepreneur. I don't know a lot about that kind of stuff, but I started this little project. And maybe I made something and I sold it on Etsy. Or maybe I like, did a little consulting thing. I set up a very basic website, created some kind of offer, and I made some money. And they get very excited. I talk about that PayPal notification that comes in. Like, you've got money. Sometimes they even get disproportionately excited. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, you know, I made $20. I worked 20 hours you know, to get that $20. <laughs> but still, it's awesome. You know? And I have seen over and over how much confidence it produces in people. It gives you security. It gives you opportunity and possibility, especially if the project takes off. A lot of people I looked at, some stories in the book, uh, this guy named Benny Shum from Jacksonville, Florida, actually, who tried out a few different things um, before finding a side hustle that really worked. Uh, he started a business designing t-shirts and selling them through Facebook ads found a really creative way to not actually have any inventory. You just designed the t-shirts, and then they were kind of shipped out when people purchased them. And within a year, uh, he was making more money from the side hustle than he was from his full-time job. So he quit his job, went into it. I also hear from people who develop the side hustle, it's successful, and they stay at their job because they like their job. And I think that's good, too. But in that situation, the difference is you're going to work every day because you want to go to work, not because you have to. Huge difference. And if the situation ever changes, and those working environments become stressful, or you're not fulfilled, then you've got something else that you can do. I know that no one has unlimited free time. I would ask you to raise your hand if you have unlimited free time, but no one would raise their hand, because we're all very busy. Uh, the benefit to being busy is that you don't have much time to waste. And you can only do what's important. And you're not going to try to be on 12 different social networks, or at least you shouldn't. You're not going to try to start a website and a blog and an online store and a video and a podcast, all that kind of stuff. You're just going to figure out, here's what's essential, and that's what I'm going to do, at least if you're going to be successful. So if you're wondering, OK, what are those essential steps? Like, what do I need to do? Uh, when you get the book, if you have the book, you can register the same website, bornforthisbook.com. You'll get a number of bonuses, including a, a PDF of 19 steps to hustle. And it will tell you, this is important, this is not important. You know, do this, and apply this in your own way. Maybe not every step applies to you, but I think a lot of it will. Here's the third recommendation. Uh, if you're the kind of person here tonight uh, who has everything figured out, and you have chosen to become an expert on a very narrow topic, then I think that's great. Good for you. Keep doing that. Um, for all of the rest of us, we feel a lot of pressure because of people like you. Uh, we feel this pressure <laughs> that we're supposed to become this highly specialized expert in one narrow thing. And we are supposed to choose a niche. And that's what we hear over and over in all the business advice. And what I saw in my research is there's actually a lot of successful people who don't do this. So some successful people do, but plenty of other successful people don't. I'll show you a few that you might have heard of. Richard Branson has started more than 80 different companies across a range of industries. Does anyone know what Richard Branson's first business was? Gas station? No. Magazine? No. Music was number two, record label. Virgin Airlines was number three. OK, so the reason you don't know is the first business didn't go so well. Um, the first business was selling Christmas trees. And he discovered it was kind of a seasonal business. So then he moved on to the record store and the airline and a cola company and a fashion line, and a cosmetics thing, and magazines, and newspapers, and finance, and all kinds of other stuff. And they're not really related, at least not by industry. It's a very values-driven growth strategy. Oprah. 
has influenced millions of people all over the world. Oprah has been a leader in media, entertainment, but also business, lifestyle, wellness, spirituality, self-care, all kinds of different industries. She's very good at what she does, but she wasn't just good at one thing. She actually found a way to create a career around multiple interests. And it's not just about famous people. Again, you can probably think of someone you know who hasn't chosen a niche, who hasn't followed that advice, and has been able to be successful. Maybe at a certain point they chose a direction. Maybe they chose a theme. But it wasn't something super narrow. So you don't have to choose a niche. So here's my fourth recommendation. If something isn't working, I think you should stop doing it. <laughs> and this really, really runs contrary to everything you've been told about success in America, about the entrepreneurial age that we live in, which has many good qualities. Um, but we are told over and over and over all these stories of persistence, of people who have tried 20 times, 25 times, only to succeed the 26th time, or whatever. And uh, we are told that persistence is the most important predictor of success. And what I saw is that flexibility is the most important predictor of success adaptability, being willing to kind of mix it up. So you hear this saying about how winners never quit. Winners quit all the time. Mm -hmm. Winners are not afraid to take a step back from that path and do something totally different. So here's a story to illustrate this. It's a story called Three Feet from Gold. In the California Gold Rush, 1851, a prospector moves across the country and buys a small plot of land. Every day, for weeks, months, years, some long period of time, he pans for gold. And he's totally unsuccessful. Nothing happens. So he finally gives up and sells his little plot of land to the new guy who comes along. And the next day, the new guy strikes gold just three feet from where the previous guy gave up. So the way this story is always told, it's this great inspirational story, it's the, the lesson or the moral of the story is first dude shouldn't have given up. Right? He gave up too early. He was like almost there. You know, if only he had stuck with it. He was just three feet you know, from success. Even back in 1851, which was a very popular meme on Snapchat, getting lots of views, everybody was like, first dude shouldn't have given up. But the thing is, first of all, there was no guarantee that that first prospector was going to be successful. No guarantee he was going to strike gold the next day. In fact, it was quite likely that he wouldn't, because he had this track record. He had this history. He had some experience with this. It wasn't the first time he tried it. So probably wouldn't have happened. And secondly, maybe even more important, we don't know the rest of the story. Just like the path in the beginning, we don't know what happened on the other path. We don't know what the prospector did next. Maybe he went on and had a better life somewhere else. Maybe he left California. Maybe he started a shovel selling business for all the other prospectors. Like We have no idea. So when we hear, try, try again, uh, I think maybe a better lesson is, OK, keep trying. Keep trying, for sure. Uh, don't give up on your dream. But absolutely be willing to mix it up. Absolutely be willing to look at how you can make that happen. And don't try the same thing over and over. So winners actually give up all the time. Winners aren't afraid to do something different. How many of you have bought a Powerball ticket in the past few months or so, let's say? Why did you buy that ticket? Oh, that was the mega Powerball. That was the mega Powerball? Huge. Dream. It was dream. It was huge. huge. Who else had their hand up? What Powerball ticket? Why did you buy the ticket? Um, because if you don't buy a ticket, you don't get a chance. If you don't buy a ticket, you don't get a chance. That is absolutely true. I'll come back to that. Uh, anybody over here bought a ticket? Is there anybody who has a different reason for buying the lottery ticket? Yes? You wanted to get rich quick and quit your job. Did it work? <laughs> Unfortunately, you're here trying to figure out what to do. OK, last, last answer. Why did you buy your lottery ticket? Because I was told that there's this urban legend that if somebody doesn't play the lottery, they buy it. For somebody else, there's a bigger chance of earning. OK, you heard an urban legend. Did it work out? Yeah, not necessarily. Not, nece not necessarily. OK, <laughs> so here's what. One dollar profit. OK, there you go. So is, is there anyone here tonight, or maybe watching on the live stream, uh, who purchased their lottery ticket with the expectation that they were going to win? Like you invested all your hopes and dreams in the lottery ticket. Right. Yes? 
How did that, how did that go? <laughs> You're still here, too. OK. So here's the point. We, we hear that the, playing the lottery is not rational. Like, it's not rational to play the lottery. Um, and I think investing all your hopes and dreams or all your life savings uh, in the lottery is certainly not rational. But when we buy a lottery ticket, most of us, we're investing in a dream. We're spending a small amount of money to have this little fantasy. What would it be like you know, if I won a billion dollars or whatever it was? And when we don't win, we're not crushed. We're just like, OK, you know, I'll try again next time or something. But here's the thing about the lottery. The lottery is not hackable. There's nothing you can do to increase your odds. It's true. If you don't play, you don't win. That's absolutely correct. But there's no strategy to it. You just buy the lottery ticket. You have the same chance anyone else here does, anyone else out there, the millions of people who bought those Powerball tickets. But the career lottery is hackable. There are things you can do. You do have some influence over it. There are strategies you can learn. There are actions you can take to increase your odds. It's actually much more within your control than anything else. So ever since Steve Jobs passed away, there's a requirement that every inspirational presentation include a quote from him. Um, so this is the one that I chose. Uh, he said, when uh, you're thinking about your life purpose, uh, or what you, want to, you know, what you want to be, what you're born to do, he said, you don't always know looking ahead. You can't always connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. You have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. So I like that quote, but I think it's not just about trusting. It's not just about being a passive observer in this process. It's not just about waiting for something you know, to come to you. It's not about leaping the net will appear. It's actually about making active decisions. It's about you know, understanding more about ourselves. OK, what, what is joy for me? It's very different. You know, very, joy is individual. What does make me happy? And how can I combine that with something that is viable? How can I use my skills in a unique way? What are the working conditions that are best for me? How do I do my best work? And how can I match that with the best kind of work? How can I navigate change? What if I want to do something different? How can I get that streak of days that matter? You know, how can I win the career lottery? How can I create more security for myself? You know, how can I create more opportunity for myself? How can I continue to grow? So it's not just about trusting that the dots will appear. It's about building a bridge between those dots. It's about you know, helping them connect with whatever influence we have. And obviously, luck plays a role. You know, fortune plays a role. Privilege plays a role. All those things matter. But wherever we do have influence, wherever we do have control, you know, how can we connect those dots? We talked about joy, money, flow, how to make more decisions with that in mind. What makes me happy? What makes money? What am I good at? We talked about the need to have a side hustle, even if you love your job can bring you great confidence, security. If you've already got everything figured out and you are the world's leading expert on something, that's great. For everyone else, you don't have to do that. There's another way to do it. You can be yourself. You can craft a career around multiple interests. And if something isn't working, I think you should stop doing it. So I am always thrilled to come back to South Florida, Books and Books, a wonderful friend and partner for many years. Grateful to them, grateful to all of you guys. And if you only remember one thing from this time that we've had so far, you might remember that Nicole wanted to be a dolphin trainer. It didn't work out, but you found something else that was good. You might remember that you expected to win the lottery, but maybe next time. Um, but if you can only remember one thing, it's OK to make mistakes. And not just is it OK, the mistakes can actually benefit you. They can give you information. They can inform your thinking so you make better decisions when you come to those paths, when you come to those crossroads. And if there is something out there that you were born to do or meant to do, why not do everything you can to find it or create it or to discover it, to kind of make it reality, to make it more than a dream, make it something that actually happens? So I hope you do that. And I hope you win the lottery. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's have a conversation. You can raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. I'll repeat the question for everybody else and for those watching. Yes, you're very excited. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great.
You were great? Um, what did you want to be when you were six years old? Uh, I wanted to be the, uh, maybe, were you here in the beginning? No. Okay, in the beginning I talked about, um, I wanted to be an astronaut or work oh, yeah, at Burger no, King. No, that's right. I'm that's sorry. right. Yeah. But I didn't grow up to do either of those things. No. <laughs> so maybe the good lesson is it's okay to change your mind. Right. How did you find your joy, your flow, and the money? How did I find my joy, my flow, and my money? Um, I tried a lot of different things. I experimented. I went down a lot of different paths. And some things worked and some things didn't. And I traveled. I learned a lot from living in West Africa and going elsewhere around the world. It definitely informed my thinking. But it took a while to kind of come to what I'm doing now. And hopefully I'm still learning. Like I don't think, in fact, I don't think I explained this earlier, which is good, you, you helped me remember it. It's not like we arrive at this point tomorrow, you know, this intersection. We are all on a journey. It is a process of continual discovery. So hopefully, like, I'm still learning about that just like everybody else is. But I think I got closer to it by, by listening, by experimenting, by traveling, by choosing different paths. Thank you. Yes? How does a presentation like this comply with your joy, money, and flow? Did you understand my question? No, can you ask one more time? Can you translate it? He was saying, how can your joy, money, and flow, how does this presentation lead to your joy, money, and flow? For me personally, yeah. how does it? Um, well, it's not just about this presentation. So sorry, he said, how's this presentation um, for those watching? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Com comply, you know, with um, joy, money, and flow uh, in, in my life. So I think uh, it's not just about this presentation. It's about the whole process for me. It's about doing the research, writing the book, speaking with all the people, trying to understand, okay, what are the common lessons? Actually, I enjoy that. I enjoy that process. Uh, I don't want to say I'm good at it. I've learned over time. And I continue to get better at it. And you know, I have been able to make a living at it. So it's not like any one particular thing. It's not like you know, here I am at Books and Books tonight to make a lot of money, because obviously I'm not. But you know, it is something that I, that I love to do and something that I'm thinking about the long term for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, is we that the side there? Or is, that is that my side? No, this is my main thing. This is not my side hustle. <laughs> this is like my main thing. Thank you, though. <laughs> what is my side hustle? Um, my problem is I have too many side hustles. I probably have eight different things that I'm doing at different times, and I actually need to focus a little bit more. So my problem is not starting things. My problem is kind of maintaining them. Is that the next book, though? Well, is that the next book, he says? Uh, I don't know. I have to learn how to do it first. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yeah. You talked about the journey. When, when you hit that, that really big bump, mm -hmm. when, when you feel like you're in the rut, Challenges seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. How have you, how have you gotten through? What were some of the bigger lessons? Okay, let's turn this into a question that we can use for, for multiple people here. When you hit the, the bump in the road, the big rut, the, how do you overcome those challenges? Who here has like one or two sentences to respond to that, or a quick story? You can raise your hand and contribute, and I'll, I'll give an answer as well. I think it's important to know like when you when you want to give up and when you want to keep going. It's kind of kind of my answer, and I'll talk about that. If anybody, yes, do you want to share real quick? Um, when I'm at that point, I have to stand outside of the box and remember why is it that I'm going that route, mm -hmm. and it still makes me happy. That means I still need to. This is a great answer. She said when she comes to that point, and she's like, "Am I still excited about it?" That's when, and she gets her answer. That's when you know to keep going. I think I paraphrased that, but that's a great answer. Yeah. Uh, you had your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, it's very similar to the other question. Like, for example, when I'm writing my book, I think to myself, is this something I should be doing? Is people going to read this? Is it a bad idea? Well, I think for me, the lesson, like, the, the, the way I knew that I was meant to write this, mm -hmm. I should keep going, is that I couldn't get it out of my head. Yes. And other Great. times, mm -hmm. and other ideas yeah. I've had, I'm like, I got bored of it. It's not a good idea. But this one in particular is like, I can't get it out of my head, so I guess I have to keep going. Yeah, great answer. So if you have this crazy idea in your head, yeah. you can't stop thinking about it, there's probably a reason for it. I love that answer. Um, and just briefly, yes? Um, I have a question. I just bought every one of your books. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my answer is yes. Thank you. Right. That's great. Because they're all good, right? So, as Chris Brogan said, they're all good. So, my question is 
which one <laughs> should I read first so fast? I want to take my nonprofit uh -huh. to the next level. So every moment that I have is either focused on life coaching, I'm a middle school teacher, okay. and I'm working on my nonprofit. Which one do you suggest I go for first? Okay, you're very kind to say that. First of all, thank you for the testimonial. Uh, I should give you some money for that later. Um, and as for which, which book to start with in that situation, uh, maybe start with a new book, Born for This. And if you, if you don't like it, let me know. I'll give you your money back. Um, I just wanted to say briefly about this question. I think it was really important. What was your name? Betty. Betty? And, and <laughs> yeah, okay. And your, what was your name? Uh, Leo. Leo. I like both of these, these, um, these answers. You know, the way that I've, I've kind of figured out this process for deciding, okay, when you, when you give up, when you keep going, um, you ask yourself two questions. And, and Betty almost said it the same way I would think, say, say it. Um, you ask yourself, is it working? And do I still like it? Do I still believe in it? These answers kind of guide your way. Very similar to what Leo said as well. Like if it's, if it's working and you still love it, great, you keep going. If it's not working, you don't believe in it, you stop. So you only go to this like, deeper level of analysis when the answers are in conflict. It's not working right now, but I still believe in it. Like I still believe in this dream. Then you have to change it somehow. You have to change how you do it, because it's not working. So you can't just keep trying the same thing over and over, uh, but you still believe in it. So maybe there's a different way that you can do it. Maybe you have to mix it up. Uh, and alternatively, it could be that this thing is working OK, but you don't believe in it anymore. Right? And there's lots of people who have who've experienced this. Like you have a job, and maybe at one point you really believed in it. It was great. But then over time, like something changed, or you changed, and now it's just kind of OK. I think in that situation, you also have to make a change, maybe not right away. You don't quit that job without a safety net or something. But you start thinking, OK, this is, this, that was fine for a time, but what's next? What's my next step? Because ultimately, you're going to be unfulfilled if you're doing something that you don't believe in. So thank you, Betty and Leo, for contributing there. Other questions? Yes? Um, I have a question. Are you familiar with a book from Cal Newport, uh, So That They Can Ignore You? Yes. And how do you, uh, how do you feel your ideas? Uh, match or, uh, or are aligned or are in contrast? I mean, because he basically, I mean, for, uh, it, what I understand of mm. it is that he deconstructs the concept of finding your passion yes. and working on that, but actually uh, getting good at what you're doing, mm -hmm. and that will become your passion at some stage. So Cal Newport, in this book, um, So Good They Can't Ignore You, um, basically presents the thesis, don't follow your passion, follow your skill. And Cal is a friend of mine. He's actually spoken at our event. Um, so I respect Cal a lot. Uh, I think what he's trying to do is um, critique this model of, of just following any passion, because it also puts pressure on people. Just as the idea that we're supposed to know our life purpose when we're 20, a lot of people are like, well, what is my passion? You know, There's things I like to do, but I don't have this one thing. Uh, and so he says, you focus on what you're good at. And I agree with that. I think that's good. I am not, um, I am also not a follow your passion, at least not follow your passion blindly, you know, kind of, kind of advocate. I think, um, as I said, it's okay to do something that you love that's not for money, that's fine. Um, but if you're thinking about your career, you can't just follow any passion. There's some passions you could follow and some you can't if you're trying to create overlap, you know, with something that you love and something that is sustainable. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. It's OK. It's OK. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's Monica, right? Thank you for saying that. There's a lot of very special people here tonight. I always say that the best thing about this experience is everybody else who comes out, not when I'm speaking to all of you. And for me, one of the, my favorite things is hearing when people connect with someone else. And so be sure you meet somebody before you leave. Everyone's awesome, and I hope that you and I can talk some more too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Monica. All right, it's okay. Thank you. Yes. How do you view this in terms of relationships? You can see that you can put some of your mm -hmm. same uh, areas of thought to relationships. Yeah. Um, how do I? Choosing relationships sure, sure. and continuing with relationships. Yep. 
how do I think of this model in terms of relationships? Uh, I think it goes to joy, and joy meaning different things for different people, and even different things in different cultures and different societies. Right? Because some Asian societies or African societies like, are actually valuing family more than you know, valuing the individual. There's a like, difference between you know, cold climate and warm climate. Same for Latin America as well. And um, so what is joy to you? And joy for many of us is good relationships, harmony with people that we love, being in contact with people. But how we do that is different for different people. Good question. Yeah, are you ready? Yeah. OK, you're good. It's OK. <laughs> you're fine. Don't worry. It's OK. Sometimes that becomes hard because then you don't follow the linear mode of operation. Mm. So my question is, in your research, or do you have testimonies of people that learn how to deal with the pressures of previous achievements, mm. almost like dragging on? Because in, in situations in my life, it almost seems like the past achievements are dragging you from uh, extending it to the stretch of science. As in people say, what, are you crazy? You're not supposed to do that. You're, you have like all these skills doing all these other things. Why would you even consider it? So the past achievements you feel have kind of defined something for you? Right, and then it just doesn't fit right. Mm -hmm. where you start wondering whether, you know, sure, you can be good in many things, mm -hmm. but is that really that fulfilling? Mm -hmm. it, it's like a lot of pressure sometimes. Mm -hmm. And maybe not from others. Maybe it's yourself where you're supposed to be, you know, sure. on target. If you're good at that, you're supposed to be on target. Right. Well, there's a lot there. I think I want to pick up on the first point and your, your point, actually, where you started. And you said, um, you, you know, we're bringing together not just me, but we're all bringing together tonight like-minded people. And like-minded people from different backgrounds. This is what I think is very interesting about this community. It's not just like young people. It's not just like some demographic. Um, it's people who are interested in change and transition and being willing to believe in a dream. And so I think, you know, if you're, if you're wondering about, you know, defining yourself because of past achievements or even past failures as well. Uh, it's important to surround yourself with people who understand whatever your dream is now. Maybe you do want to do something different. Maybe you were really successful in something before, but that's not what you want to do going forward. You have to make sure that there are people in your environment uh, who support you, especially if there are people who are opposed to that or saying, why would you do that? That's silly. That's a crazy idea. You shouldn't do it. You know, you have to find people who also believe in you. So let's do three more questions. Three more great questions, all right? No pressure, yeah. I like how you put your hand up after I said great questions, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll be going to world domination for the first time okay. this summer. Great, Ooh, all right. Excited. Cool. Um, and my question to you is, um, you talked about creating communities. Hmm. Um, how do you find, because I know you're great on content, right? And creating content and sharing and disseminating content. How do you find that different with online communities versus offline, like world domination? Mm -hmm. um, creating community or creating content with, I'll, I'll explain that. What is World Domination Summit? Um, <laughs> trying to think about how to, how to answer both, that, both those things. <laughs> so first, first of all, let's do, that. let's do the first part. World Domination Summit, or WDS. How many of you have been or are familiar with it, at least? OK. Uh, WDS is a gathering that we do every year in Portland, Oregon, uh, for thousands of people, just like we have here tonight, it's like the same kind of people who are interested in these kind of topics. Uh, we come together for about four days, and, and we have different speakers. Uh, Cal Newport's been there before, Brene Brown, Gretchen Rubin, uh, lots of different people. And then we also have gatherings, conversations, workshops. It's all about facilitating experience uh, to help people pursue their dreams. That's WDS. So uh, as for how I find it different, well, it is very different. It's, uh, and I like doing both. Uh, I like both online community. I think we have people watching online. That's great if you guys are watching. Um, but I also find a lot of value in this. And I think it's, it's, it's fun. It's lasting. It's sustainable. I started with this story about going on the 50-state book tour. When I went on that 50-state book tour, I mean, I went some places that had like tons of people. And then I went to North Dakota, and there were like four people. It's kind of funny. But the thing is, those four people, six years later, I actually still know three of them. Like they're still kind of follow, they're still part of things. So I believe in the value of building long-term relationship, and you can do that online. You can do it offline. I try to mix it up. Great question. Two more questions. Got to be really good questions. All right, in the back. Chris, I wonder if in your research you encountered people who had some unexpected life event that shifted them from what they thought they were born for to what their true passion or what they really. 
had been born for, and secondly, whether in those circumstances you equate joy, the joy in your model, with satisfaction, as opposed to some, I don't know if you know what I'm yeah. getting at. But yeah, it's a great, it's a, it's a hard question. I mean, it's good, it's good though. In my personal circumstances, yeah, please tell us. our daughter nearly died of, a, of an illness that she battled for five or six years, and while I thought when it was over, I never wanted to hear about it again, mm. it sort of has redirected me in a completely different, on a completely different path where I've written a book about it, I travel around the country and speak about it. The monetary piece hasn't really materialized, but when I think about it, it was what I was born to do. Right, it matters to and you. I, never would right. have thought, I mean, it never would have happened, mm -hmm. and I would have given anything for it not to have Of course, happened. of course. But I'm just curious whether you encountered that what your thoughts are. Right? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that, that with us. Um, yes, I mean, I, have, I did hear several, I don't want to say the stories are similar to yours, because every experience is unique. Um, but certainly stories of, of people who encountered loss, uh, like very, very grave loss uh, or some kind of hardship or other life-defining moment. And it does, it does create a shift. You know, it, it does create a shift. And, and what I saw is, uh, you know, people can have a shift because of something like that. Uh, or they can have a shift for a completely, you know, different reason. Or maybe they just kind of no longer want to do the thing that they did for a long time. And so I guess seeing shifts uh, was kind of a common, commonality. The reasons were different. Not everybody had these life-defining moments like that. Um, but people who kind of fit this model of like born for this, you know, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. They they very rarely have done one thing all their life. Some of them have, but those would be maybe the 15 to 20 percent. Most people they've actually done, you know, a few different things, and maybe they change because of that, or maybe they change just because they they wanted to do something different. Yeah. I'm kind of going through that now myself. So. Uh, okay, this is going to be the last question. This has got to be awesome. Um, who here thinks they have the most awesome last? Okay, I've got one hand, two hands. Um, wow, it's tough, man. Um, all right, the most awesome question. Here we go. What are the cultural differences? You mentioned you traveled uh, to different countries and continents. Uh, so, what differences are in the different continents in the behavior you mentioned? What differences are there around the world? It's kind of a big question. No, but the yeah. if, if you say you want to give an awesome sure, sure. question. No, it's good. Like, I didn't say a hard oh, question. You guys, it's good to you. Okay. African, Asian, yeah. American. What are the main differences? What do you all think? Sure, sure. I, I want to be careful. So he's asking what the, what are the differences, you know, among cultures and societies. I, I want to be careful about generalizing too much. Um, you know, I've, I've always said people ask me about the going to every country in the world. I've never claimed to be an expert on every country in the world or any region um, like that. So I tend to kind of look at some more broad stroke things. And I mentioned the, the value of family, the value of society, contribution. Uh, people think of contribution and service quite differently. People think about freedom differently. Um, people do think about economic value differently, for sure. Um, people value skills differently. So there, there are different valuations you know, in each of these things. Um, but I do think you know, most people around the world, like most people want to be happy. Most people want their children to have a better life than they did. You know, so there's not too many commonalities. Like, I'm actually not a big fan of saying like, oh, you know, people around the world, we're all the same. Actually, we're not. That's what's great about travel. You can go to different cultures, and people do do things differently. But at a you know very surface level, you know, people kind of want progress. People believe in striving, and kind of bettering themselves, or at least bettering their children, or bettering their, their society. You're looking at me like you don't like this answer, but it was a great question. I'm going to acknowledge you. If we can talk some more later, that's great. I forgot to mention a couple of things um, before Victor comes back. Oh, there you are right there. You're like ready to pull me off. He's like, he's done. Um, talked about the lottery. I actually have a lottery ticket for all of you. And when you come and see me over here, I'm going to give you a lottery ticket. Now, I said that the lottery is not hackable, but I made this lottery, so I hacked it. And um, your odds of winning are pretty good. So come and see me for that. And um, because Books and Books is so great, I would love to encourage you to support them. Um, this event is free. I'm not paid to be here. I know some of you already have the book from some other source, and that's fine. But if you can also support Books and Books tonight, that would be wonderful. And with that, I'll say thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, then. Quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home, you still have a couple minutes to call the number on your screen, and we can send the book to wherever you are in the US free of charge. 
For those of you here in the house, we have Born for This, as well as all of Chris's other books for sale at the counter in the front room over there. He's going to be signing at the table to the right of the screen. And it's always great when we have him here at Books and Books. Please give another hand to Chris Gillibout. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris.